Spy Pond is in the center of the town of Arlington, but it is also more than that. In many respects, it's also the center of Arlington's life. In the past, it's been a center of industry, for farming, manufacturing, and ice harvesting. Now, it's a center for relaxation and recreation, for fishing, boating, and ice skating. This pond has been the heart of Arlington throughout its history. This is our pond. This is Spy Pond. Spy Pond has been here for 50,000 years, since the middle of the last great ice age, though back then it was under a wall of ice a mile thick. The pond is a kettle pond, a hole carved into the ground by moving glaciers. When the glaciers melted 15,000 years ago, the holes they left behind filled up with water and created the ponds we know today. Spy Pond is 103 acres in area. Its average depth is 12 feet and is 36 feet deep at its deepest point. Spy Pond is home to a variety of plants and animals, including over 100 species of birds like ducks, swans, Canadian geese, cormorants, and three kinds of herons, as well as animals like box turtles and snapping turtles and many kinds of butterflies. If you look carefully, there are tricks to locating some of these inhabitants. One thing to watch if you're ever on the pond, you look for two periscopes. Periscope here, periscope here, and that is, a, and it moves across the water in parallel. That's a snapping turtle. Um, muskrats, you very often see. Muskrat, you look for a V going through the water with a little, little head at the, at the front of the bee. The pond is stocked regularly and home to fish like eels, bluegill, carp, perch, and bass. There are some, they're called the tiger muskie. The tiger muskie um, cannot reproduce. It's a crossbreed. Um, it was seen as a good idea because you wouldn't worry about stocks overrunning place. But I think it was last stock maybe 15 years ago, but just a few weeks ago someone caught a tiger muskie through the ice. It's about that big. The Massachusetts tribe of the Algonquin Native American group were the only people to live in the area until 1635 when European settlers founded the town of Monotomy, which would later become Arlington. Like most colonial towns, Arlington was settled by farmers. Land ownership records dating back to the 1630s mention many farms on the banks of Spy Pond. For as long as Arlington has been settled as a town, this 100-acre pond has been named Spy Pond though its spelling has changed over the centuries, and no historian is sure where the name comes from. I think there was a Russian spy, and he got killed, and his dead body's dumped in this pond. I don't know if it's like, I think that before the spy, like the pond was named, there was a group of Indians, and they called themselves like the Spy Ponders, and then they lived around the area of the lake, and then that's how the pond got its name. Um, probably because um, Europeans came and they are Native Americans. What? <laughs> Maybe they like hid under the water and started spying on their neighbors. Like, oh, hey, what you doing? Uh, maybe in revolutionary times they killed British spies and dumped them in this lake. I mean, yeah, makes more sense. One theory says that explorers looking for fresh pond in Cambridge spied another pond. It wasn't the one they were trying to find, 
so they named this new discovery after the very act of its discovery before moving on. Another explanation suggests that on the original surveyor's map, the pond was shaped a bit like a spyglass. Nobody knows what the real reasoning was. There are no records of the decision. The name of the pond seems to have popped into being with the founding of the town. Spy Pond has been a center of town life ever since the 1600s. Arlington was first settled as a farming town, and farms grew up quickly around the pond. In addition to cultivated crops, townspeople would gather and use native plants that grew on the shore. This activity resulted in one of the pond's most famous stories. On April 19, 1775, the day of the first battle of the Revolutionary War, the old men of Monotomy, a group of men deemed too old for the Minuteman militia, captured a British supply wagon on Massachusetts Avenue. Eighteen British soldiers were captured. A few managed to escape and made it down to Spy Pond. There they threw their weapons and supplies in the water, so at least those wouldn't be captured. The soldiers hoped that, being unarmed, the colonial militia would not fire on them. These few uncaptured redcoats continued to walk around Spy Pond until they came across a local woman, 55-year-old Ruth Batherick, digging up dandelions on the banks of the pond to make into medicinal poultices. These soldiers, tired and separated from their unit, surrendered to her, begging for safety. Mother Bathrick led the soldiers to Captain Ephraim Frost's house, which was being used as the militia base. According to the story, Mother Bathrick said to these British soldiers as she turned them in, If you ever get back, you tell King George that an old woman took six of his grenadiers prisoner. The story must have made it back to England, because later a war critic in England wrote, If one old Yankee woman can take six grenadiers prisoner, How many soldiers will it take to conquer the colonies in America? Being a large water source in the middle of a growing town, farms flourished on the banks of Spy Pond for hundreds of years. One of Arlington's best-known crop was its lettuce, which was sold up and down the East Coast. But with the rise of urbanization, the pond was increasingly used in other industrial endeavors. In the 1850s and 60s, Spy Pond was briefly the main source of running water in Arlington. The Spy Pond Water Company was formed and used steam-powered engines to pipe pond water up to the reservoir and out to Arlington houses. But the biggest and most famous product of the pond was its ice. The ice business began in 1806 with the New England entrepreneur Frederick Tudor. In the early 1830s, ice was being cut and harvested regularly on Fresh Pond in Cambridge. And in 1840, another businessman, Addison Gage, brought the ice harvesting business to Spy Pond. Ice was cut, harvested, and sold from Spy Pond for nearly 100 years and was a profitable trade for most of the 19th century. Ice was cut from the pond in the winter then carried to the ports in Boston, where it was shipped out across the world. The Addison Gage Ice Company was the first company to begin harvesting ice on Spy Pond. In the winter, Spy Pond would reliably freeze over, and when the ice was 12 inches thick, harvesting could begin. Day laborers were hired in crews of up to 300 men, and 150 horses would work 12-hour days on the ice. Every winter, crowds would gather on the shores of the pond to watch these ice cutters, the spy ponders, at work. Handsaws and sledges were used for most of the work. Teams of horses scraped the snow off the surface of the ice. Then large blocks of ice were cut, 
floated loose, cut smaller, and then floated or dragged to the ice storage houses on the shore, where escalators and conveyor belts moved the finished ice blocks into storage rooms. Workers were paid daily, but not in cash. Instead, they were issued vouchers that could be redeemed in the company's Cambridge office for money. Because it would be so difficult to go into the city all the time, the vouchers themselves were accepted as currency by many Arlington stores and merchants. Boys would be paid a dime to clear pebbles, sticks, and leaves from sections of the ice about to be cut. In later years, a crew was hired in the summer, too, for quartering blocks and loading them onto trains and wagons for shipment. In the 1830s, when ice was first being cut on Fresh Pond, the ice blocks were brought into Boston on the Charles River. Ice harvesting on Spy Pond, though, began about the same time that the Lowell Railroad was being built which made it easier to transport ice. The Fresh Pond Railway led to the offshoot Fitchburg Railroad, which went from Fresh Pond through Arlington, which was then West Cambridge, and eventually out to Lexington. The tracks went right by Spy Pond. This offshoot was even called the Ice Railroad. This is the railroad that, in 1991, became the Minuteman Bikeway, a bike trail on the Rails to Trails Hall of Fame. From this railroad, the ice was brought into Boston, to the docks, and then shipped out on large clipper ships. The main destination for the ice was the southern states, especially Georgia. The Civil War stopped all ice shipments there, but after the war ended, the southern states resumed their position as the primary market for New England ice. Spy Pond ice went not only to the southern United States, but was shipped all over the world. Ice ships went to India, Brazil, Bahamas, and many tropical places. Ice shipped this far south was usually used to cool the food and drinks of the rich. The ice was packed in sawdust to insulate it and stored beneath the waterline to further keep it cold while on the boats. Sometimes, cargoes of fruit would be shipped along with the ice. Ice was also sold closer to home. Residents of Arlington and surrounding towns bought ice for 35 cents per 10 pounds. In the summer, ice sellers would deliver ice from carts, similar to milkmen. After the ice was cut and harvested, it wasn't usually loaded straight onto the trains. It was stored in the ice storehouses around the edge of the pond. These storehouses were large, double-walled wooden buildings with their walls insulated with sawdust and cork. More sawdust and hay were used inside. In a large storehouse, there would be seven to eight storage vaults holding five thousand tons of ice. The ice could keep for more than a year. The first ice houses were built on Spy Pond in 1840, and by 1884, three clusters of ice houses ringed the pond, all owned by the Gage Ice Company or William T. Wood Ice Tool Manufacturing. The ice itself was only part of Arlington's ice industry. The creation of ice cutting tools made an important mark, too. It started with Abner P. Wyman, a blacksmith with a shop near Spy Pond. He began by repairing the ice cutter's tools. 
and later specialized in making ice harvesting tools. In 1845, Wyman's business was purchased by William T. Wood and became Wood's Ice Tools. Wood's Ice Tools not only made ice tools, but invented many specialized ice harvesting tools as well. It was one of the greatest Arlington industries until 1905, when it merged with a New York firm. Because the ice storage houses were made of wood and insulated with highly flammable materials, fires broke out often. In 1894, a row of ice houses on the Belmont side of the pond burned down. Then, in 1913, a Lake Street ice house. Then, in 1925, a Pond Lane ice house. The most spectacular fire, though, was in May of 1930, when the last standing ice house on Linwood Street caught fire and burned to the ground. The flames threatened the whole town for a time. This fire, along with the rise of electric refrigeration, marked the end of the ice business on Spy Pond. All the ice business buildings around the pond were eventually abandoned, left empty into the 1950s and 1960s until they burned down or were destroyed. If you look closely, you can still see evidence of some of these buildings on properties that abut the pond. When I was young, again, it was in the 50s or so, 1950s, there was an old building right on the shore of the pond, and that was the ice factory. My dad, who had grown up in Arlington, he was born in 1915, he had grown up in Arlington, in the east end of Arlington, he said that he told us all about the ice making factory which was apparently still operating when he was young um, and it was the biggest ice producing company in this whole part of the country um, shipping ice to various parts of the world but when i was young there was a fire and that the building that had been the ice house storage facility actually burned. My dad at the time was the captain, the Monday night captain of the auxiliary fire department. And when the alarm came in, my dad grabbed his boots and his raincoat and his helmet and went running out to try and put out the fire, but unfortunately the building was completely destroyed. But Spy Pond wasn't just a business site. In the winter it was used for ice cutting, but in the summer it was a popular resort spot. Sharing the banks of the pond with the ice houses were large country houses to which wealthy Bostonians would move in the summer. A guide to the Boston area from the time called them some of the most costly and elegant suburban residences in America. It was considered a beautiful country lake, away from the grime of the city, a more natural place. It even became a spot of fascination for a romantic period poet, John Townsend Trowbridge, who owned an estate on the pond and wrote poetry inspired by Spy Pond. I row by steep woodlands, I rest on my oars, under banks deep embroidered with grass and young clover. Far round in and out wind the beautiful shores, the lake in the midst with the blue heavens over. Even city folk, who did not have their own country estates on the pond, would come to sail, race horses, and play tennis in the nearby lanes and parks, and stay in the Spy Pond Hotel. And there was a Spy Pond Hotel. The southeastern corner of Spy Pond is all residential houses now. But in the mid to late 1800s, there was a large, popular hotel on its banks. Town banquets were given in the hotel, and regiment of Union soldiers were quartered at the hotel and drilled in the parks in preparation for the Civil War. 
However, the hotel also became notorious for drunkenness and brawls. The hotel gradually lost favor and was abandoned until it burned down in 1907. But long before and long after the Spy Pond Hotel, the pond was a center for town recreation and civic activity. During the Civil War, Union Army soldiers conducted training drills at Camp Shepard, which was located by Spy Pond. After the war, the newly formed Massachusetts Rifle Association, still the oldest active gun club in the United States, used the shooting range there to hold its first official rifle shooting match. During World War II, Arlington youth, doing their part for the war effort, used the Spy Pond Fields as a recycling collection location. But the most lasting and consistent use of the fields was and is for local sports. Residents have always played sports on the fields surrounding Spy Pond with baseball teams and tennis clubs among the groups that met in these town open areas. Boating has always been popular on the pond as well. Throughout much of the 1800s, a sailing regatta on the pond was the star event of most holidays and local celebrations. Throughout the summer and autumn, people swam and fished in the pond, and boating, sailing, and even yachting were popular activities. Though even then, the pond was full of thick, tangled weeds and was known to be dangerous. People drowned in the pond, and after one accident in the 1850s, which three young women drowned, yachts were largely discontinued. But even then, the pond remained a center for sports and recreation, and sailboats and rowboats were near permanent fixtures on the pond. The Arlington Boat Club arose from the love of boating on Spy Pond. Its headquarters and boat dock was a long, low building where the Arlington Boys and Girls Club is now. A sportsman's association for young men who didn't own boats of their own. It was a very popular local feature and its members were nearly always out on the pond in sailboats and kayaks. One of Arlington's favorite sports obsessions is hockey, and in fact has been so for a very long time. Arlingtonians started playing hockey on the pond in the 1800s and have never stopped. Arlington um, was and still is, in my opinion, the uh, ice hockey capital of New England. They had a great tradition going way back in the 30s, the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, thousands are right through now uh, being one of the top uh, high school hockey programs uh, in New England or even the country. Uh, the longtime Eddie, head coach Eddie Burns, I first met him uh, in person. I was skating down there with my dad and um, he asked me what grade I was in and I said I was in the eighth, I know it might have been seventh. And he said, well, if you want to get a good education and play hockey, then you come to Arlington High School. And I think it's important that the kids know the tradition of the hockey program at Arlington High School. Uh, unique nickname, there was no other school, to my knowledge, that has that nickname, the Spy Ponders. And uh, we're very proud to have that put on the uniforms. And one of the, one of the sets of uniforms we did buy uh, for the high school was all gray, including the pants because uh, that honors all the players that played way back uh, in the 30s and the 40s because all they had uh, was one uniform and it was gray socks, gray pants, and gray shirts. And most of the time the team photo was taken uh, in Old Hall because the ice had melted at that time and there was nowhere for them, no ring for them to have a picture taken. 
Dick DiCaprio, the head coach, he went through a bunch of old trophies when he found a, a trophy dating back to 1895 when Arlington used to play Waltham yearly. It was an Arlington uh, Watch City, Waltham Watch City versus Arlington High School uh, game that they'd play each year and share the trophy. And the winning team would get to hold on the trophy for a year. But that goes way back to 1895. So I'd say it's probably easily one of the oldest high school hockey programs in the country. Arlington High School used to play their home games there, or games there actually, as did Cambridge, if I'm not mistaken. And when I was in high school, we practiced there, and Coach DiCaprio's team practiced there a couple of times. When you practiced, um, you had to be really good uh, to put the puck on another player's uh, stick, uh, tape to tape passes, because if you made a poor pass, then you'd have to skate for miles, uh, not really miles, but you'd have to skate a distance to retrieve the puck. My uncle Johnny Lax grew up on Spy Pond and learned to skate and play hockey. He played hockey for Arlington High and the team often practiced on Spy Pond. He went on to play for BU and was inducted into the BU Hall of Fame. But one of the greatest sources of pride for our family was that he took the skills that he honed on Spy Pond all the way to Bavaria, Germany in 1936 as number three for the U.S. Olympic hockey team where they won bronze. As far back as the history of skating on Spy Pond is concerned, I know they got the name the Spy Ponders because they used to play their football games at Spy Pond Field, which hadn't, uh, which was the name of the field, but a beat writer for the Boston Herald in the early 20s christened them the Spy Ponders as they overlooked a uh, beautiful Spy Pond. Also, um, the Arlington Arcadians, which was a semi-pro hockey team that played in the Eastern Mass Hockey League, made up of uh, high school and college graduates. They would also practice down at Spy Pond and sometimes uh, skating down there, I'd be with my buddies or, or my father would bring me down because he knew they were practicing or just skating and uh, I couldn't believe the uh, skill level of these guys. They were like, you would think they were on the Bruins or something. The first Sunday in December, head coach uh, Richard DiCaprio would organize a run through the town of Arlington with the varsity ice hockey team. We'd meet behind the high school, uh, run down to Pleasant Street via Mass Ave, and go up Pleasant Street and down Gould Road. And uh, that's where we'd talk about a little bit of the history of Spy Pond, Elizabeth Island, the ice houses uh, where they'd harvest the ice. and. Um, the high school would skate when a new sheet of ice was formed. Whether just among friends or in championship winning teams, Arlington has played hockey on the pond for more than a hundred years. And this tradition shows no signs of stopping. It's just one of the things that makes Spy Pond today so popular in modern Arlington life. unique story is that when my father Jerry was a senior at Arlington High School in January of 1937, uh, the team was practicing and um, he went to retrieve a puck and got the puck, sent it back to, to the team and then he fell through. Uh, got out, Coach Downs told him that uh, Jerry, uh, you might as well head home. So he walked home up uh, Gray Street to Newport Street where uh, I grew up and he grew up. And by the time he did get home, all the equipment was frozen solid on him. So he went down cellar where they had coal that gave off heat, as well as a furnace. So he had to stay down cellar and um, let everything melt. And then went upstairs, took a hot bath, and his mother, my grandmother, Nana Bott, made him a nice warm supper. When Bonnie and I were senior scouts, we actually did a sailing badge, and we started to learn how to sail on Spy Pond at the boys, well, it was then just the boys club, not the boys and girls club, but it was their dock. So it, a 
afforded lots of, lots of fun and good experiences. Going down to Spy Pond between the baseball field, you go down Linwood Street and then along the embankment there uh, towards the Boys Club, which is uh, now all fancy benches and seats now. There were no benches back then. I think there were a couple of picnic tables they used. But people would be fishing and uh, a couple of old timers, they were probably in the 60s and 70s, they would go down and they were fishing for eels and uh, they would take them out and uh, I'd ask him, I asked one day, what do you do with them? And he said, oh, they're wonderful. And he got an eel out, it had to be about three feet long. He cleaned it right then and there. And uh, the, I don't, he took it home. He said they fried them, fried eels. Uh, we, in celebration of one of our successful baseball seasons, the entire team went again behind the boys club and uh, jumped in in our baseball uniforms and made all the coaches angry. Uh, so it was, it's always been very important to me. I spent a lot of time swimming on the pond. My older sister learned how to swim, I think, in Spy, po in Spy Pond with Ava Balage as her teacher. And we um, spent a lot of time swimming on the out to the Levens raft and that was in their backyard and out on the pond. Um, we had a little rubber raft that we would take all over the pond. Uh, being born, raised, and living most of my life here, Spy Pond has also been very special to me. As a kid, my brothers and I skated on the pond in the winter. We swam and we sailed in the summertime. We we're active members and continue to be of the Arlington Boys and Girls Club. Uh, the first home I bought was on the banks of Spy Pond on Hamilton Road. Another one, just on the other side of the railroad tracks, uh, behind, uh, if you go down Linwood, Street near the Spy Pond is now a baseball field, a little league field, and a large set of apartment houses. Well, when I was little, those apartment houses were uh, celery, carrots, and uh, radish field. And occasionally, as kids would, we'd sneak in and we'd steal a couple of carrots or radishes. And the man would always catch us. We were about seven, eight years old. And the punishment we got was on Saturday, we'd have to go down and pick those things, radishes and celery. Looking back on it, at the end of the day, it worked us for about three or four hours. We didn't like it and we'd rumble and moan, but at the end of the day, he'd give us a big bag of vegetables to take home with our parents. And again, looking back on it, I think it was a conspiracy between him and the parents. Parents would get free vegetables, we'd stay out of trouble, and he'd get picking for free. In my youth, probably around 10 or 11 years old, there was a wonderful uh, rope swing, not very far from where the existing boat ramp is. And what could be better at that age than on a hot summer day? swinging off of a tree into the water until the Arlington police would come and chase you away. And uh, we would wait, wait till they left and like any good 12 year old, just go back at it. In high school, I remember going with a group of friends one night and we took candles down to the ice and we lit them and put them out on the ice. And then we skated all around in the, in the light of the candles. That was very magical. Spy Pond is still a central part of the Arlington life today. It is a place for sports, a site for town-wide events, and boasts a long stretch of playgrounds and playing fields along its bank, drawing old and young alike to enjoy what the pond has to offer. One fixture of the town that residents have made great use of is the Arlington Boys and Girls Club. At some point, Nearly all Arlington youths have spent some time in clubs or activities at or sponsored by this community center. Located right on the banks of the pond, it offers a unique resource. The Arlington Boys and Girls Club has been around since 1937. Uh, currently, we have over 6,000 boys and girls that are members. We also have over 500 adults that are members here at the club that use the club from swimming to aqua aerobics to using the fitness room. Um, for our over 6,000 members, we have a multitude of activities including swimming, gymnastics, um, we also have a lot of um, educational programs that we've started. Um, we have a career launch program, a um, jobs, jobs, jobs program, and many other educational programs that take place in our, our new learning center. 
when I was in middle school, I went to Spy Pond East, which was an alternative school in the basement of the Boys and Girls Club. And I used to walk to school along the edge of the pond, which was a wonderful walk. And I could go the whole way along the edge. There were no neighbors who had fences up at that point. Um, you know, we're very lucky to be located on Spy Pond. To my knowledge, you know, we're the only Boys and Girls Club in, in Massachusetts, at least, that is located on a pond and, and is able to have um, a boating program. The Islander Boys and Girls Club boating program has been around since the 1970s. In the past couple of years, it's gotten even bigger. Uh, we have uh, over 180 boaters uh, that come down uh, to do open boating in the afternoons here down at Spy Pond. Uh, they can go sailing, they can go kayaking, they can go canoeing. Uh, we have a paddle boat now. Um, we have a boating exploration camp. Uh, we run nine weeks of it with uh, 18 kids per week, and um, that sells out uh, every year. Um, and uh, we even run uh, Special Olympics sailing uh, about four times uh, a summer. Uh, we open it up for uh, uh, adults in Arlington with special needs. We play games with the kids. We take trips out to Elizabeth Island. Um, sometimes we'll play a game called Barry Bonds where we'll hit some tennis balls out off of the dock and uh, have the kids try to catch it into their kayaks. Uh, it's a real great thing for the kids to have here in Arlington. Uh, not a whole lot of boys and girls clubs uh, are built on the water, so we can actually run a boating program on site. And uh, we're one of the only boys and girls clubs in the country to be able to do that. Have a, boat, have a boating program run on their, on their own site. Well, the Boys and Girls Club is the most prominent place on the pond offering recreation and community gathering. It is far from the only one. Spy Pond is a place for so many kinds of events, whether personal or for the whole town. Uh, sometimes at the pond I would go like ice skating during the winter and at the pond sometimes my brother has right across from it there's a baseball field and sometimes my brother has baseball games there so I sit at the rocks and I look at all like the boaters and stuff and I boat on the lake during the summer all the time and, yeah you know I'd purchase a, a small sailboat and I would take my daughters Ryan and Kendra um, at times on the summer afternoon, take the family raft to work, and we'd uh, enjoy you know, sailing on Spy for a couple of hours. And they got a close-up look at that time of Elizabeth Island. You know, they, they weren't even aware at that time it was an island. So uh, I did learn in Spy Pond, though, that you don't want to turn the boat completely upside down because it's fairly shallow. And my sail, to this day, still has stains on the top of it from whatever is at the bottom of Spy Pond. Lately, um, my grand grandchildren come down, and we live uh, in Kelwin Manor, which is right on Spy Pond, and so we walk over and we feed the ducks, and actually my in-laws live down in the same house we're in now, and they would mind my children growing up and take them down to the playground and feed the ducks and the geese when you were allowed to feed the ducks and the geese. <laughs> now you're not allowed to, to feed them anymore. <laughs> So now we take our grandchildren down there, but we don't feed the we just look at them. When I was a kid, I used to go like skating on Spy Pond, but I was always really scared too because I thought the ice would like crack and stuff. We decided to bring the varsity down there back in 2004, and I brought my young son Kyle, who was a uh, second year peewee at the time, so he was 12 years old. And um, the temperature at the time was uh, four below zero. We practiced from 320 to quarter of um, five. Uh, we practiced, actually it got dark out, but um, it was colder in Arlington that day with a wind chill of 21 below than it was in Alaska. I like to boat at the boating thing. Hang out. 
Spy Pond Field is the site of a big field day full of events on Town Day every September. It's a fun day full of sports and games and pony rides. But the big celebration at Spy Pond Field is the night before on Town Night. The afternoon is full of games and at night, fireworks burst over the pond. But the most popular event of Town Night at least among middle and high schoolers, happens on the field in the light of the fireworks, the annual shaving cream fight. A mass of teenagers smearing each other with shaving cream. It's a strange tradition, but a beloved one. Another important site on Spy Pond is not on its banks, but right in the middle of it. Elizabeth Island is small, about two acres, but is naturally linked with the same colorful history as the pond itself. Ever since colonial times, Elizabeth Island has been left wild. It was first sold by the town to a private owner in 1704 for 29 shillings and for centuries remained private property changing hands and changing its use many times over the years. It has been a private retreat, a popular camping spot, and a bird sanctuary. In the mid-1800s, when the Fitchburg Railroad line was being constructed, one proposal would have had the tracks run straight across Spy Pond, right over Elizabeth Island, which would have had the rail supports built on it. Interestingly, just like the pond that surrounds it, the origin of the name Elizabeth Island has never been conclusively established. The deed by which the Fitchburg Railroad purchased the island from the Russell family in 1868 is the first recorded instance of the name Elizabeth Island. The railroad was not built across the pond, but instead along its bank and the various owners continued to use the island in their own ways. It was zoned for two houses. The, 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 the caveat was um, the town has a, has a uh, law on the books where you have to have uh, road frontage. You can't develop landlocked land, and um, it would have been difficult to get the permitting to put a road in front. <laughs> uh, in the end, it wasn't buildable. Best that it's in public hands. There was a sportsman association at one point. This was what, quite a long time ago, 50 years ago, and um, they 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 used the island. I don't know if they owned it or not, but they used it for a bird sanctuary, to where to raise birds for um, for for hunting and things like that. But they still they still managed it as a sanctuary. Um, Long time ago, people uh, there's a fellow who tried living on it for a while, and back in the '60s, there was uh, some hippies who tried to uh, homestead there, and, <laughs> uh, 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 but it's it was clearly time for it to become a public property. Through a joint effort among the Arlington Land Trust, the Arlington Conservation Commission, the Massachusetts Audubon Society the state and the citizens of Arlington. The town bought the island back in 2010, making it public land again for the first time in 300 years. This purchase ensured the protection of this precious wildlife preserve situated in the center of a very densely developed area. A landmark so central to the life and personality of a town always develops its own folklore and mystery, and Spy Pond is no exception. There are tales about this pond, 
passed down over the years that may be a little too tall to be true. Sometimes in the summer I go boating and the guy, he takes us out and we go to this Elizabeth Island and there are reasons why they call it Elizabeth Island and he said it's because there's a kimono dragon that lives on the island. And whenever we go out there we try to find it and we never can. But they say that some people have gone there and they found giant piles of leaves with imprints of like dragon prints in them and then they say that they a girl went out there one day and she never came back and <laughs> I don't know. So uh, we have a spy pond monster here just like um, Scotland has a Loch Ness monster and um, the spy pond monster is a Komodo dragon named Lizzie. The legend is that an old man, old rich old man, a long time ago that lived in Arlington uh, bought a Komodo dragon off of the black market to keep as a pet and kept it in his basement but it got much much too big so he had to find a place to put it uh, where he could keep it safe where nobody ever went on to so he picked Elizabeth Island in the middle of Spy Pond. Elizabeth Island is the only island on Spy Pond uh, lots of birds nesting there and uh, he put Lizzie out there a long long time ago about 30 years ago uh, and when the old man passed away of old age uh, Lizzie was still out there and uh, that was the legend of the spy pond monster and uh, Komodo dragon has flourished out there for this many years and um, has a uh, unlimited food supply and uh, a lot of mud to hibernate in and uh, some of the children say that they've seen the Komodo dragon. I've had pictures of the Komodo dragon. Um, and uh, I've never seen it myself, but I can't in good conscience say that there is no spy pond monster. They say that if you go out to this buoy exactly 50 feet away from shore on the curve of where the Arlington Boys and Girls Club is, you have to go out in a canoe because um, that's the only way it works, and you go up and you put the tip of the canoe onto the tip of the um, buoy thing, and you paddle backwards and you say this weird thing, I forget what it is, but, and then the current will drag you to where the haunted buoy's closely located to. And they say it moves to a different spot every year and you can never find it, and it's like three feet underneath water, and. So, the, um, a long time ago, before, before um, the Boys and Girls Club was built, when there was nothing there, um, and it was when um, Russian, Russian spies were here, and there was a Russian spy who went on Spy Pond every day and spied on the government and all of the congressmen and um, one time there was a microburst and he, he got caught on his buoy and he drowned and then the buoy got pulled underwater three feet and it's still and the legend says that it's still attached to him and he's a ghost and he haunts and moves around all the time. Some other stories about the mystique surrounding the pond may actually have their basis in fact. Have you heard the one about how in the 1950s NASA conducted secret experiments on the residents around Spy Pond? Well here's what really happened. NACA the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, a precursor to NASA, really did perform tests around Spy Pond. Specifically, they wanted to test noise reduction technology of low-flying aircraft by observing the response of people in residential communities. They flew small planes over Spy Pond, hoping to judge how disruptive the noise level was. 
Testing ended early, however, when they realized that though the noise wasn't causing a problem, the spectacle was. People kept crashing their cars while they were staring at the airplanes. NASA has not provided the only bit of aviation-related spy pond lore. Some Arlington residents swear they've seen a plane land on the pond. This may be possible. Spy Pond is listed in the Seaplane Pilots Association Water Landing Directory as a legal site to land a small seaplane. Other stories are better documented. There are records that Cotton Mather, the Cotton Mather of the Salem Witch Trials, came to Spy Pond in August 1716 to go fishing. While he was fishing, his canoe overturned and he fell into the pond. He took this as a sign from God, and from then on preached that recreational fishing was a sin. At least one local legend is 100% true. In 1959, Arlington resident Arvid Carlson was fishing at Spy Pond when his line caught on an object on the bottom. What he thought was an ordinary stick turned out to be a a six-and-a-half-foot-long tusk, most probably a mastodon tusk dating back to the last ice age. The tusk is still on display at the Arlington Historical Society's headquarters at the Jason Russell House. Such an important landmark in town provides so much for the community but it is still a natural site in the middle of an ever-expanding urban environment, and the community needs to take care of the pond, too. Organizations like the Friends of Spy Pond Park, a nonprofit organization dedicated to upkeep and protection of the parks around the pond, help keep the area beautiful, clean, and usable. The Friends of Spy Pond Park were responsible for the new playground and walkways around the banks and they sponsor community days to encourage people to use the parks more and help keep the parks and pond banks clean and healthy. The Arlington Recreation Department now has a seasonal kayak rental program aimed at promoting boating on the pond. Another organization, the Spy Pond Committee, takes care of the ecology of the pond. They try to keep the pond clean, the plants and animals healthy, an invasive species out of the ecosystem. It's part of the environmental subgroup of an entity called Vision 2020 in Arlington. Vision 2020 was, was formed in approximately 1990 to look ahead 30 years, which seems like a long time then, and um, what are some of the things that might be impacting the town. Out of that came this environmental subgroup, and we are now part of that. At Spy Pond, the big issue is a neglected urban pond runs into decay pretty rapidly. Its pond is saturated with runoff from lawns. It's got lots of debris coming in from Route 2 and uh, lots of miscellaneous bird droppings which carry all kinds of invasive species to the pond. Our role is to monitor, to talk to experts, uh, technical experts, service providers of different types, and over a while, build up a body of knowledge that we can inform the town, the town primarily through the town meeting uh, process, and um, develop a stewardship over the pond. But the biggest project we tackled recently um, was one of um, invasive Phragmite species, species, and Brad Barber here is the um, man who led that effort. And it was a pretty remarkable one. You might want to talk about that one. These. This is a common reed, the ones with the tassels on top. Um, not an unattractive plant. It's actually sort of, it looks like marshes, but it was all over Spot Pond. And, uh, and in fact, that little patch that I had in front of my, my yard grew into a, a, almost a wall of phragmites that was like 12 feet high and seven feet deep and maybe 20 feet across. We're, we're now in the um, steady stream, steady state stream. Right. 
fourth year of fourth year now treatment. So yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. It's, kind it's of now now under control. And the pond itself is about 105 acres, but before Brad started tackling them, the Phragmites were up to almost three acres, and they were growing at about 30 percent a year. So that's how much of the pond had been consumed by them, and it was growing fast. Yeah, we had we had it was growing in seven foot deep water and um, it was growing on land 100 feet from the water and it was growing the hot the biggest ones are maybe 15 feet tall so it was a, it was a lot of vegetation so that was that was dramatic because it was visible and it's on mm -hmm. land the well the phragmites look attractive they crowd out there's no bird life in them there's no turtles in them there's no, no nesting birds in the base it's not like cattails where it's a very natural environment. So one, one thing that's neat is that um, with, the, with the pond opening up, so for, we've now had five, more than five years of the pond really being quite usable, um, uh, people can make better use of the pond. <laughs> So it pretty much spans over uh, five decades, you know, with me, you know, the use of the uh, use of the pond, and uh, it's awfully nice to see some of the improvements that have been made down on the on the frontage, and that we've rather reclaimed it as a resource, not just a place for the water to run off Route Two, you know, during a heavy rain. Say, I think that Spy Pond really is a jewel in the town. The fact that it's right there and contained completely within the town of Arlington makes it very special. So I just feel like the pond has been a central focus for me in my life and I'm so happy that we have it and it's such a wonderful resource. All these people and all these stories make one thing clear. Spy Pond is a valuable and important place in our community. Its history is Arlington history, and it is part of Arlington's identity. We need to share the stories of Spy Pond's past in order to keep its history alive and to preserve our collective understanding of its place in Arlington's story. But we need to care for it going forward, too. We need to protect the pond to be sure it will remain the vital and central part of the Arlington culture and surrounding ecology that it is today. Our, our theme is the pond will be best protected the more it's appreciated and it'll be better appreciated if more people use it. Mm -hmm.